There is a certain warmth over here in the air, there's a certain feeling, there's a certain connection, which I think that when you walk in from the outside, you kind of breathe it. And um, so it's good to come back from time to time, because sometimes when you're here constantly, we tend not to notice things or appreciate things. So I, I'm sure that that's only the, the sense of commitment and, and the feeling and the bracha and the prayers for each other, but all the people that are involved in Chazak and people that are here tonight, I'm sure there are a lot of things to do on a Sunday evening besides to come to a shir. And the fact that you are here, I mean, I'm here, so I do this for a living. Well, why are you here? Right? So you're here because you're saying, Rabbi Nishalaylam, I want to be better. I want to try. I want to be a better person. So whether you hear the right things tonight or not, or whether it actually has its impact, one thing is for sure. You made the attempt. I remember the last snowstorm, which goes back two years ago, I think. So I went into my shul, and I started davening. I started saying Ashrei for Mincha. And someone came over to me and said, you know, it's really not covered to daven in your uh, plastic over your hat. I said, you're right. So I take the plastic off. And then he tells me, this guy's really, this guy was really into my wardrobe. He says, <laughs> you're, it's really not covered that you should wear your rubbers by davening. Now rubbers, that's already complicated. Right? I only put them on because my wife made me put them on. So I sit down and like, when you get my age, I shouldn't say my age, I should say my weight, the uh, putting on of rubbers and taking off the rubbers becomes a shickle acrobatic uh, feat. It should be, I think, an Olympic event, actually. <laughs> and I'm sitting on the chair and I'm trying to uh, get them off. Now, it's easy to take off your whole shoe. The trick is to get the rubber off without the shoe. And even more embarrassing, it, you shouldn't uh, take off the rubber with the shoe and your sock. That is a little embarrassing. Sure. All right, so I managed to, to get them off. Then you have to tuck them into some type of a corner to make sure that uh, you find them afterwards and you find yours and not uh, someone else's, which I am uh, not so good at. I have left, I think, umbrellas in almost every shul in the northeastern United States, including the West Coast. At the time that I once came back and I was so proud, I said to my wife, you see, I brought home the umbrella. She said, there's only one problem, you didn't take an umbrella today. <laughs> brought home someone else's umbrella. Okay, so I'm sitting here and I'm really struggling to get my rubbers off in order that it should be, uh, that the davening should be a bekavadika davening. And indeed the person is right. Because what can I tell you? I finally got my rubbers off. But my mincha, it wasn't so hot. I mean, I tried to daven, but I, honestly I got distracted and it just didn't... Uh, I did my best to say the words, but it just didn't click. And I stepped out, so I walked out and I saw the guy, a guy again with the rubbers, and I said to him, you know, I want to thank you. He says, for what? After 120 years, they're going to look at my mincha, and they're going to say, that's how you pray, thank you so much. And they're going to say, that's how you pray to your Creator? Your heart was one place, your mind was elsewhere, I said, the mincha, that they could take away from me. But taking off those rubbers, that they can't take away from me. <laughs> Whether I, that I know, that I did for God's sake. Yeah, I took off those rubbers, put them back on. There are times in life, it's the little frustrating moments. So that those are the moments uh, that create Yeshua, he says, and did it should for Baruch and ben Bracha, and, B'shach, and everyone else, and he's a Yeshua, and a Simcha, and should be a Schus for the Neshama. Getting angry is an opportunity. First of all, a little bit disclaimer over here, that I am talking to myself. I am not talking down to anyone. I am not saying that I am the master of calmness and uh, Baharaya can show you the prescription to my blood pressure medication. But I do like to talk to myself sometimes and calm myself down. So at the risk of not being accused of someone who's like totally lost it, so I like to speak to crowds, but really, I'm really talking to myself. You know that person that came to a doctor and says, I talked to myself the whole day, what should I do? And the psychiatrist says, so what does it bother you? He says, you have no idea what a nudge I am. He says, you know what it means? 
a lesson, the lesson I got in, in, in Bar Park, there is a shul, it's called Shoimer Shabbos. Legendary shul. There's minyan in there almost 24 7. The last ma'ariv is like 3 a.m. in the morning. And uh, also downstairs there's food, and it becomes like a, well, a quasi homeless shelter. And uh, there's a tzaddik there, he doesn't like me to mention his name, he's like the Gaba, he literally takes home the clothes of these people and washes it in his washing machines and brings it back the next day. So I'll never forget, I walked into the coffee room, I was coming home late from a wedding, I stopped off the Dava Marib, it was like at 2 a.m., and there's this fellow sitting there, and he's darshaning away, he's uh, lecturing to himself, and I'm listening in, I was just curious what he had to say, and he looks at me and says, it's not of your business what I say to myself. <laughs> So I learned then that, you know, he's right. I have no reason to, to get it. So having said that, let me just say one more opening remark. Chazak is such a beautiful name for an organization because it's a compelling factor. It's a driving suggestion. It's telling us that we have no right to give up. Now, you know that when we finish uh, Chumash, we finish the five Chumashim, end of Bereshis, End of Shemais, end of Ayikra, end of Bamidbar, end of Devarim. So we call out which words, which three words? Chazak, Chazak, and Nis Chazak. Why do we say it twice? What, are the, what do these words mean? Chazak, Chazak, and Nis Chazak. Chazak means you take the bull by the horns. Try to be Mechazak yourself. Tomorrow morning, I start my diet. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to start davening. Tomorrow morning, I'm not going to get angry. Tomorrow morning, I'm not going to scream at my wife or kids, my husband and kids, and so on. Tomorrow, it's going to start. You know what? Whatever happened, happened. I'm turning a new leaf. Comes tomorrow, and you don't turn that new leaf. So you know what you do? You say, I'm going to try again. Chazak, chazak. And you keep doing this. You keep saying, I'm going to try again. What did the guy say? That he lost, uh, he came into a Weight Watchers place and said he lost thousands and thousands of pounds. You know, he tips three. You know, he loses, he gains, he loses, he gains. But the Rabbanu Shem says, look, I know you're a human being. And what I want you to do is chazak. You're nervous. You have anxiety attacks. You have an anger issue. Whatever your issue is. Your issue is battling the temptations in your life. You're battling depression. Don't stop. Chazak. Take off those rubbers. Line yourself up. Chazak. But if it hasn't worked till now, why should I keep trying? It hasn't worked. And the answer is, the Rabbani Shalom says, that I am asking you, chazak, chazak, up until a certain point. At one point, the nis chazak. When a word begins with a nun, the letter nun, and it is not part of the shayrish, what it means is passive. It means it's going to happen. You're right, we can't be mechazik ourselves. We can't. There is no magic wand. That we can say, Psh, gone is my depression. Gone is my anger. Gone is my frustration. Gone is my fear. We can't do it. We can try. The Rabbani Shalom, our Creator, does have that magic wand. But He will only engage it when we try a certain amount of times. So the message is, Chazak, try. You may fail. You're going to see your limitations. Chazak. Then you say, Rabbi Shalom, I am who I am. What can I do? I'm going to keep trying. At one point, finish chazek. At one point, it becomes passive. The Rabbi Shalom says, you took off your rubbers enough time before mincha. That I am going to give you that inspiration. That when you daven, it's going to be with feeling. It's going to be with the sense of amuna and betachain. And when you finish, indeed, you may not need that blood pressure medication. You know, Gaboyim, the Gabay of the Shul, the one who's in charge of giving out the Aliyahs, calling people to the Torah, and sending people up, they take a lot of abuse, right? It's tough, tough to be a Gabay. The Yerubyonis and Abishits once came into a Shul, and he had to daven there with Shoshana Yom Kippur. He didn't know the people, but his minig was, his custom was, always to stand next to someone that he felt had a broken heart. Feel that somebody that has a broken heart He's the kind of person that I want to daven next to. So he sees there's a man standing in the corner, and this man goes, Oh, oh yeah, Shem, I'm a nothing, I'm a nothing, I'm a piece of dust. What's a human being? I'm not much like a piece, I'm, I'm less than a piece of dust, I'm a worm, Hashem, my life is in your hands. He goes, This guy has mastered the art of modesty. Let me go 
and pray next to him. Comes to read the Torah. Apparently he didn't get the aliyah that he wanted, or he didn't get an aliyah at all. And he goes over to that Gabbai, and he gives him a piece of his mind. He is yelling and screaming at the top of his lungs. So Rabbi Yenis and Abish just goes over to him. He says, I'm going to ask you a question. I just heard you saying you're a piece of dust, that you're a nothing. What are you yelling and getting so upset that you weren't given the proper honor at the Torah? So the guy says, he says, Rabbi, I don't understand you. Who was I talking to when I said I'm a piece of dust? I was talking to God. He says, toward God, compared to God, I'm a piece of dust. But compared to that Gabbai, he says, how dare him? <laughs> so Gabbai, they, uh, they take a hit. So does everyone else, really, that is an Isaac B'Tzar Chetzibur, that's willing to get committed and go out there and, uh, and do. I'm sure all the organizers of Chazak have gotten their uh, frustration. You just said, right? They've got to be nervous about the events. And every event that works, you should know, has to have someone that doesn't sleep at night that's nervous. So the fact that you're nervous means it's going to be a great success. I'm telling you. You should know. It's when we're not nervous. That's when you have problems. If you're nervous, it's going to be great. You're going to see. So... Every yeshiva has one person that doesn't sleep at night. So they, they, uh, what do they say? They say there was a man once, uh, he had to marry off his daughter. So he wrote a letter. And he wrote, Dear God, I have to marry off my daughter. I don't have any money. I need 400 rubles to marry her off. Please, you gave me this daughter. Send me the money. So the mailman in the post office is sorting the mail. He goes, dressed to God. What does he do? Turn it into a paper airplane and shoot it? He figures, well... I'll give it to the closest thing to God that I know. He had it delivered to Baron Rothschild. So the Baron you know, is opening his mail. One of those days, it's addressed to God. He says, oh boy. He opens it up and he reads the letter. He goes, this is cute. So he calls in his, uh, his secretary. He says, write out a check for 300 rubles and send it to the guy. He says, okay, this you know, he got three out of the four. He says, the next year, he has to marry off the next daughter. So once again, he writes, dear God, please, you gave me a daughter... Please, I need 400 ruble. P.S. God, don't send it through Rothschild, okay? He takes off 100 for himself. <laughs> you know, people that are, that are out there and they're giving, part of the thing of giving is that you're caught in the frustration of the moment. It's very interesting. The, the Gemara says in Masech Tz Baba Basra that there are four people that died without any sin whatsoever. The only reason they passed away was because death was decreed by the Eitz Hadas in the times of Adam and Chava by Adam and Eve. Who were these four people that came up with a 100% clean slate? They are, anyone know who they are? They were Binyamin, was one of them, correct? The other one was Kiloev, David's son. Oh boy, we got a tough crowd here. Gotta be careful, gotta prepare next time. Okay, Yishai, very good, who was David's father, and one more. One more? No, no, no. I know Yovi Moshe, made mistakes. No, was Yo, was Moshe, okay, yeah? Amram. Amram, correct. It was Amram. Oh, yeah, he came close, I'm sure. But uh, So it was Amram, who was Moshe Rabbeinu's father. Ishai, who was David's father. Kalaev, who was David's son. And Binyam. So the Cypher says, Akasha, you old Davin Shmon Esri tonight, with or without our robbers. And we said, so what did we say? We said, Barichatu Hashem, Elekeinu, Elekei Vesenu. And then we went ahead to say, we said, Elekei Avraham, Elekei Yitzchak, Elekei Yaakov. We didn't say Elekei Yishai. We didn't say Elekei Amram. We didn't say Elekei Kloyev, Elekei David. Who are the Shiva Rayim? Who are the seven, the seven shepherds in the Sukkah? The seven nights correspond to Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Mashar, and Yosef, and David. None of those seven made it to the list of people that died without Chayt. So why are they on the list and the other ones are not? So the Chsam Seifer says an unbelievable thing. He says those four that the Gemara enumerates died without any sin whatsoever. Amram, Yishai, Kloyev, and David. They, they died without hate, But they lived relatively segregated lives. In other words, although Amram was the head of the people, but they came to him, he answered the questions, he did what he did, people copied him. But he never got into the thick of things the, the organizational aspect of Klal Yisrael and, you know, the Shalom Bayis between the husband and wife throwing mud pies at each other. And I, I don't know if he didn't, but Lamaiza, he didn't get into the full... Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, Yosef, David all did that. They took on Klal Yisrael. 
and they jumped into the mud. Now, you get involved in these things, you are going to make mistakes. You get involved in these things, it is impossible to go through without chet. Now, mind you, even if you didn't get involved, it's a tall order to go through life without chet. There's still only four that made it. But the fact is, Avram Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, Yosef, and David, says the Chsam Seifer, all made a conscious decision that we are going to get involved to help people, and once you do that, it is impossible not to get your hands dirty and not to make mistakes, and not to say the wrong thing to someone, to be accused of the wrong thing. They knew it, and they got involved anyway. And they made mistakes. Of course, their mistakes, you know, we are, there would be mitzvahs for us, but they, like uh, so my father used to say, the sins of the Dar Hamidbar are in the Torah. If you miss one of those words, you're not Yotze. It's not a Sefer Torah. Our mitzvahs aren't in the Torah. But relatively speaking, they were sins. So who does a Kaddish Baruch Hu appreciate more? Those that are willing to get into the mud for someone else, knowing you're going to make a mistake, or people that stand back and say, listen, I'm not getting involved. Obviously, look who Hashem picked to be the Shiva Rayim. The Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, Yosef, and David. Okay. So there is this story in Eretz Yisrael, in actually, I, I think it was in London, it's brought down in the Sefer of the Harivna, where there's a Achnasa Sefer Torah. Achnasa Sefer Torah means they bring in a brand new Sefer Torah, and as you know, when they bring in a brand new Sefer Torah, it's a tremendous joy, it's a tremendous simcha, and everybody came running, and they're dancing, and it's unbelievable. Now, there is a custom that when you donate a new Sefer Torah to a shul, that that new Sefer Torah is used the first year, one cycle in the Kriya Sefer now apparently the Gabai of this shul, whether he was slighted, whether they didn't really ask him beforehand, didn't consult with him about the arrangements, but something went a little haywire, and he wasn't so happy with this new Sefer Torah, and he argued afterwards that there is the old Sefer Torah that the shul has is a nicer Sefer Torah than this one. The Ksav is more Mahudr, it's a nicer letters, and therefore it says, Zeh ke li that we have to glorify God. So we're not using the new Sefer Torah, we're using the old one. Naturally, the family that donated the new one was not very happy about this. But the Gabbai said, I'm the Gabbai, and that's the way it goes. We're using the old Sefer Torah. So there, they would open up the Yaron Kodesh, and here's the brand new, beautiful new Sefer Torah with the beautiful white mantle, as it is in Ashkenazi circles, it's just the, the cover. And out of the box, and they, he takes out the one with the green, the green cover, the, you know, the old Sefer Torah. So one of the children from the family of the people that donated the new Sefer Torah is not to be outdone. What does he do? Middle of the night he goes, opens up the Holy Ark, the Aron Kaidish, and he switches the covers. He puts the white one on the old one, and the green one on the new one. So when the Aron Kaidish opens up Shabbos afternoon, the Gabbai says, the green one, no problem. They take out the green one. Once they take out the, off the cover, they see, ha ha, guess what? It's the new Sefer Torah. Now, there is a halacha in Shulchan Arach, okay, that once a Sefer Torah is taken out from the Aron Kodesh to be read, even though it was not the intended Sefer that you wanted to take, let's say it was. Uh, turn to the other side, you know, you're up to Bereshus, and this is up to the Zeis HaBracha, which means you're going to have to turn the entire Sefer Torah, you are not permitted to put it back, because it is considered an embarrassment to the Sefer Torah if you take it out and you don't use it. So once, al pi halacha, according to law, once the Torah was on the table, ready to be read, it could not be put back. But the Gabbai was so infuriated, he said, put it back. I said, you're not allowed to. Put it back. No, they put it back, and they did put it back, and they didn't put it back, and there was a whole thing, should they fire the Gabbai, and there was a huge uh, place went, uh, unfortunately, as Klaali Stroll does, there was a very big machlaikis and a lot of tempers flaring. Somebody was a rub once that uh, took over in a new shul. And they started davening, and someone came over to the Rav and said, you know, the minute is here, you sit by Mariv until Shmon Esrei. He said, okay. He sits down, somebody else comes along and says, you know, the minute is here is we stand by Mariv during Shmon Esrei. So the Rav says, well, what's the minute? Do we sit or stand? 
have half people say sit, the other people have to say stand. They start screaming and yelling at each other. He says, stop, stop, stop. The Rav says, who is the oldest member of this community? He said, Rav Anshul, but he's in a nursing home. We'll go ask Rav Anshul in the nursing home. So they go to Rav Anshul. He's like a little, you know, you okay, Rav Anshul, yeah, I'm the new Rav. Oh, how old are you? 99, so nice to see you. Rav Anshul, what is the custom in our shul? Because you're the oldest member. Do we sit during Mariv, during Shema and the Brachais? He goes, yeah, yeah. I, 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 you see, you see, wait, 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 let, let me double check this, says the Rav. Rav Anshul, is the custom here, do we, do we stand during Mariv? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, uh-oh. He goes, Rav Anshul, let me explain something to you. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. He goes, the whole, so my first Marav as the Rav, and the whole shul is fighting and screaming and yelling at each other. He goes, yeah, yeah, that was always the custom, he says. <laughs> For sure. No question about it. So the question was brought before the Rav. No doubt that the Gabbai was wrong for ordering the Torah to be taken out. Once the Torah is taken out, the Torah has to be used. But what about his original uh, Taina, his original assertion, that, wait a second, it's very nice, you donated a Sefer Torah, but we have a Sefer Torah that technically has a nicer handwriting, a nicer sound. So the Rav pointed out a Shalos Vachuvus Maharsham, I think perhaps today's is yard site. And the Marsham says, under such circumstances, you are to use the new Sefer Torah, the one that was donated. Provided, of course, that it is a kosher Sefer Torah. Wait a second. What about the Indian of Ze, Keli, Vianvei? Aren't we always supposed to use the nicer Sefer Torah? So he answered, it doesn't apply over here. If you're walking on the street and you have to buy a lighter for your candles for Shabbos, you say, I want to glorify Hashem's name, I'm going to buy a nicer one. You have to purchase an esrik, I'm going to glorify Hashem's name, I'm going to buy a nicer one. But if you have two Sifrei Torah in the Oren Kaidish, how are you glorifying Hashem's name? I'm taking one, but I'm not taking the other. That's like going over to a father and says, your son, Yanko, how handsome, how charming, what a mensch, ah, not like your other son bearish, what a dope he is, what a schlock, what are you? it's not worth it, you, you, you didn't do the father a compliment, you haven't earned any brownie points with him, if you're embarrassing one, and you know, I always say this story when I started doing the Dafi Yomi Shiorim, so there was an old man in Florida, he used to call me up every single night, or call into the office, and he would find some mistake that I made. It was either some grammar mistake or some mistake. It was like I had to pass his test every night. And one night, he calls up, he says, Today, I listened to the entire daf, and I found no mistakes. He went, shoo. He goes, not like yesterday that you said this wrong, and two days ago that you said that wrong, and three days ago I said, do me a favor, find a mistake, okay? Because if you don't find a mistake, I get the Hazar Sashir on the entire, all the mistakes I made in the last three years. So, you, so the, the Marsham says a Mayurdika Yisai, a tremendous foundation in halachic thought. The purpose of a nicer mitzvah of spending money is to glorify something. You want to glorify your service to Hashem. But if you're doing it at the expense of something else, you're not glorifying Hashem's name. So by saying, I'm going to use this Torah because this Torah is nicer, henceforth this Torah is not so nice, that's not glorifying Hashem's name. You're canceling out, you're doing more damage than good. So therefore stick to the original custom of Zakei Livaveyu. And I think that there's something that we have to learn from here. Because we are a Sefer Torah. Yisrael is yesh, shishim, ribli, isis, letayra. There are 600, approximately 600,000 letters to the Torah, depending how you count the letters. And there is approximately, originally, 600,000 Jews that received the Torah. And we are all descendants. Each and every one of us is a letter in the Sefer Torah. We are the Sefer Torah. What governs the halachis of Sefer Torah governs us. When you come out of your mother's womb, Hashem made a decision that Hashem took this Sefer Torah out of the Oren Kaidesh and said, I want to use you. The proof is that you exist. That means Hashem took you out of Olam Haba, sent you down to this world, brought you to this world. Should someone come along and say somebody else is better than you, that person is not performing a service to Hashem. 
Because glorifying one child while making fun or downplaying another is Yatsa Scharoi Behefseidai. You're doing more damage than you're doing good. That's number one. Number two, the idea is in terms of our life, Hashem does not want us to be the best, to score brownie points, to make it to the top. Hashem wants us to perform the chazak chazak. Given who you are, I want you to be the best person that you can be. And a lot of people are down and frustrated in their lives, and we get angry when things aren't going our way, but how do you know what's called your way? You don't know that. You don't know that. There's a famous story, Rabbi Krohn writes it in his book, that uh, was a man, he was very sick, and he came into a camp in the country, and he was learning, uh, he never learned Gemara before, he was learning out of an art scroll Gemara, and one day he looked very down, and one of the Rebbeim went over to him and said, you know, Shalom Aleichem, he says, listen, he says, I'm not well, and I'm so happy you're here in the shul learning. He says, I learned Gemara, I learned out of the English Gemara, and I can't even follow the English. You know, I see the way you guys are learning. What's my learning? Like, what does God need my learning for? What kind of a Sefer Torah am I? So he said, I've got to tell you a story I heard last night. That he read in some doctor's office, he picked up some music magazine, classical music. And there was a famous reporter that came to some hotel in Manhattan to interview a famous conductor who was there overnight. And the guy said to him, the interview stops at 8 o'clock because I'm listening to a certain symphony orchestra in France that's going to be on the radio and I want to hear it. He says, fine, I'll watch you. He sees the guy put his ear to the radio and he's listening the entire symphony. Uh, 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 uh. And when they finish, so he says to him, well, that sounded very nice. He goes, that wasn't so nice. There were supposed to be 35 violins and there were only 34. He said, you heard on the radio that a violin was missing on the other side of the Atlantic? He says, yeah. So this reporter, like, he didn't buy it. So he actually investigated, called the director of the other symphony, and it turned out he got to the bottom of things that one guy uh, either didn't show up or he showed up drunk. So they told him, do me a favor, just don't let that stick touch the violin, okay? And they just go back and forth. But there was one violin not playing. So he went back to him and said, how did you hear that? So he said, you don't understand, I am the conductor, right? The easiest part, just go like this. He said, I, my job is to make sure that every single musician is doing what he does for this symphony. When something is missing, I hear it. He says, the Rabbi Shalom is the conductor of the world. Don't say, what's my Torah worth? What's my mitzvah worth? What's my bracha worth? When you are doing it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is listening to you. Now it means two things. It means A, you're part of the puzzle, or B, by you doing your job, you're doing what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you to do. Well, let's focus a little bit more on the topic of the evening, which is anger. Someone told me this story. The Baba Verebbe, of Shloim HaZuchayel of when he first came to America after going through Gehenna of the worst order, he was in the west side of Manhattan. And believe it or not, he had no minion. Okay, to think that 70 years down the pike, we're talking about tens of thousands of Hasidim, he had no minion. And his son, Reb Naftali, was the next Rebbe, had also come then, he had escaped earlier through Eretz Yisrael, he came back from Eretz Yisrael, they were together. And Friday night, this is how they got a minion. They went at a little shul, they went out on West End Avenue, and they stopped the person, and they said, you look Jewish. Are you Jewish, Mr. Ayid? And sometimes people would come, and that's why they put together a minion Friday night. So this guy comes, and the Baba the Rebbe says to him, you know, you look, is uh, that Ayid? And he goes, Ich bin Ayid, bin geboren geworden Ayid, aber ich will nicht sein kann Ayid. I was born a Jew, but I don't want to be a Jew. And he rolls up his sleeve, and he shows the Rebbe his number, and he goes through, and he lost his kids, and he goes through Auschwitz and the gas chambers, and he's angry at God, and he's steaming, he doesn't believe in God, which, by the way, is a contradiction. You can't be angry at God if you don't believe in God. But the Rebbe wasn't going to bring that up with him. Don't you dare, don't you dare ask me if I'm a Yid. And he's like, you know, venting and screaming and yelling. And he goes, where were you in the Haim? Where were you back home? Back home, he says, I used to dab him for the Amin in front of hundreds of people. So the Rebbe heard, ah, oh, this guy still likes the Amin. Huh? Okay, I got him over here. You know, he threw that in. He said, how would you like to come in? No, no, I'm not praying anymore, I don't believe. How would you like to come in and dab in for the Amin? Uh, you know, maybe for old time's sake, okay, he comes in, and he puts down a nice lechadaydi, and he sings it, you know. 
So the Rebbe says, come back any time. And the other people say to the Rebbe, How could, a person just spoke such api courses. Heresy. How do you call him into... But he's so full of anger and spite. He's not full of anger and spite. The Germans are angry. It's the German within him that screamed what he went through. Anyway, comes the next Shabbos, he doesn't show up. So the Rebbe says to his son, go look for him. He says, Rebbe, Father, where should I look for him? I think he's on the other side of the park. Okay, he goes to the other side of the park. In the park, he's walking with the person, and they see this guy is sitting Shabbos, Shabbat afternoon, Shabbos afternoon. He is sitting on a bench, and he's smoking. And they go over to him. He's like, get Shabbos. He goes, get Shabbos. He looks at his newspaper. He goes, my father wants to know where you are. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, he wants the Ahmed. You know, he wants to know if you want the Ahmed again, he says sarcastically. So they run back and they tell the Rebbe, Rebbe, we caught him red-handed. Shabbos afternoon, he's sitting and smoking. The Rebbe said he's not smoking. The Germans are smoking. It's not him. But he's cursing, he's cursing God. He's saying, he's not him, it's the Germans that's cursing. Rebbe, he shows up the next Friday night. Yeah, he's the um. They didn't see him again afterwards. Didn't see him. The next time he surfaced, 35 years later. And he walks into the big Baba Vashul in Bar Park. Hundreds and hundreds of Hasidim elbows his way all the way up, gets through the secret service around the Rebbe, goes over to him and he says, The Rebbe, Gedenkmach, Rebbe, do you remember me? He says, No, who are you? Yankel, Yankel, remember I davened Friday night for the Ahmed, the West Side? He goes, Yeah, yeah. He says, Rebbe, I am marrying off my last grandchild. He said, you know, all my children are Shomrei Torah Mitzvah. I would like the Rebbe to come and be Masadr Kiddush. I'd like the Rebbe to come and be officiated at the wedding. So he says, I don't do that anymore, but I'll come to the Sheva Brachas. And he calls his son. He says, listen, I have to go to a Sheva Brachas. The Rebbe calls his son. I don't want to go alone. Can you come with me? So his son is wondering. The Rebbe has so many attendants. Why? Okay. So he comes with his father. They walk in. And everybody there stands up, and there's a room full between his children and grandchildren, and sons and sons-in-law and daughters and daughters-in-law, maybe a hundred people, most of them sitting and learning, many of, all of them, Shemrei Taira and Mitzvahs, and the Rebbe dances in front of the kaulas he customarily does, by a Brachis, when he walks out, he calls over his son, he said, did I tell you that it was the German smoking, not him? Did I tell you that the anger was the anger of the Germans? That it wasn't his anger? That it was someone else? Chazak, chazak, v'niz chazak means that there are times we say things we ought not to say in marriages. There is no marriage in the world that spouses didn't say things that they ought not to have said. And there is no employer-employee relationship in the world that somewhere along the line, people didn't say what they weren't supposed to say. Our job is chazak, chazak, to bounce back. When we hear a person screaming and yelling at us to say, it's not him screaming, it's not him yelling. There's something going on in his life. He is in pain. Keep it going. You know, the Chavetz Chaim, he wrote a sefer on Lashon Hara. And a man once came to the Chavetz Chaim and he said, I wrote a sefer about the ills of caste, of anger. And he wanted the Rebbe to give what's called a haskama, uh, you know, a, a letter of, that it's a good safer. So the Rebbe told him, he said, I'm not giving it to you. He says, why not? So the Rebbe said, because I, I don't want to. And he said to the Chavetz Chaim, how dare you? And he blew a fit and a tantrum and started throwing things around the room. And he said, what's wrong with my book? You just want to sell your book? He said, listen, my friend. He says, before I put out my safer on Lashon Hara, I can tell you that for 40 years, 40 years, I never spoke one word of Lashon Har. He said, I had a feeling that the writer is not as sincere over here. They were between four eyes, so it wasn't Lashon Har. He and the guy yelled and said, it's not true, it's not true, I never get angry, and he was furious, but obviously he was contradicting himself. Chavetz Chaim writes, that there are, there are, when a person does an Avera, a sin with his hand, so that affects his hand. A person does a sin with his foot, it affects his foot. And our remach evarim, our 248 limbs, correspond to the 248 
positive mitzvahs to say. The Shasa Gidim, the 365 veins, correspond to the 365 loisases, the things we're not allowed to do. And all of the Tariq mitzvahs is the body of who we are. Uh, the Chavetz Chaim once sent in the Gabbai and said he's coming in at Chatzais, he's coming in at midnight to make an announcement. And the Chavetz Chaim taicht, he translated the Lekai Neshama, and the God is going to take our soul and return it to us. La'asid lavai, v'chiyas amesim. La'asid la'achzira. In that word, hachzira, in the hey, there's a little dot, emphasis. The way God takes it is the way He's going to give it back to us. The limbs that we're going to have are the limbs of what we created. Now, says the Chavetz Chaim, when a person gets angry, his entire body is inflamed. That means his mind, that means every, every aspect. When a person is angry, every last bone in his body has been kindled. So therefore, what he does with that anger is not just an issue of his hand or his foot. It's an issue of his entire body. The Reb Tzaddik, in his writings, the great Hasidic master, takes this a little bit further. He says there are certain moods which affect our entire body. You eat matzah, you're doing a mitzvah with your mouth, with your teeth, with your digestive system. You have a mezuzah, you're doing the mitzvah with your house. Conversely, a person does a sin. He's wearing wool and linen together. So he's willing or wearing a wool and linen jacket. So that part of his body. There are certain modes in our life that affect our entire being. It's an all, it's like try to be the analogy to a CAT scan or a PET scan, Rahman al someone shouldn't need it, that takes x-rays of his entire body at the entire time from every single angle. And those situations in life are when we get angry, those situations in life are when we are inflamed with passion or a taiva, and those in situations in life are when we're terribly depressed and we want to give up. Those moods affect our entire body. Now, Therefore, it is an opportunity. What is the opportunity? The opportunity is that if we come out of it correctly, we have now corrected our entire body. Whereas if a person committed certain sins with his hands, with his feet, with his ears, with his eyes, with his nose, once he falls into one of these three categories and he's faced with the test of overwhelming anger or passion or depression and he does his best as a human being to try to overcome it, so as a result, you have now corrected your entire body at one in one shot. Okay? I'll try to explain this. There were two Talmidim, two disciples of the Rebbe, of the uh, Sadegeri Rebbe. They were learning, and one of them discussed the Gemara that says, if you save one person, save a person's life, it's as if you save the entire world. You go straight to Gan Eden. And the Rebbe came by, and the Rebbe told him in Yiddish, of a Nishmit Kambacha. He turns around and goes, he didn't speak that mode of Yiddish. He said, what, what, what was that? He says, not with a whip. See, Rebbe, what does that mean, not with a whip? So he says, let me tell you a story. So they tell him a story about Chaskel. They called him Chaskel, Red Chaskel. He was big, he was huge, flaming red hair. You didn't want to start up with him. And he drove a wagon, and he would drive it at night, and he was rough and tough and rough on his wife and rough on his kids and rough on anyone that got in his way. You didn't cut off Yankel on the highway and get away with him. So clearly he wasn't going in the right direction. But as a Maise Shehoyah, Kachoyah, as one story took place, that once he had a job, he was riding through the forest that night at full speed, which is, of course, very, uh, you need to do that if you want to get stopped by highway robbers. And he sees a whole family fell into a, went off the road and they're slipping down a mountain. He doesn't want to stop for them, because if he stops, he could be attacked by highway robbers. And to make a long story short, at the end, his conscience doesn't let him. He stops, he dives into this mud, saves the mother, saves the children, saves everyone, pulls the whole wagon up, he gets sick afterwards, carries them over to, to, a, to a hut, you know, starts a fire, warms them up, he saves their life, okay, and that changed his life to a certain degree, that event. Later on, after 120 years, he gets up there to Shemayim, and you know how these stories go, they put his sins on one side of the scale, they put his mitzvahs on the other side of the scale, boom, 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 boom and, his, and they, uh, the sins overweigh it, but then they take this one mitzvah, they take everything, even the mud, and the mother, and the father, and it, boom, okay. So they say, Ganadin. So he goes into Ganadin. He doesn't know what to do there because he didn't earn it on his own. 
So he's like, you know, uh, I'm bored. Like, so what would you like? You know, so I, I would like, you know, I wish, like, what's your favorite thing to do? Oh, I got a whip and that horse can whip it. So they give him a whip and he's walking around like whipping the walls, whipping the slim. People are sitting there trying to learn and they're going like, could you like whip someplace else? So he said until they were misspelled for him, they davened for him, they should have his tick and he should know what he wants. So they said, ah, they said, this person, he, uh, so that's what the Rebbe meant. The Rebbe says there's different ways to get into Gan Eden, but not with a whip. You're a fool if you're walking around with a whip. You have to earn it, meaning you have to belong there. And I've said this story before. I heard it from a Yid. He said he knows he's going to be together with his wife up there in Gan Eden. He said, how do you know? He says, my wife, she's such a sadeka. She's so pure. She davens the whole day. She cooks for people. She visits the sick. She's going to get up there. They're going to send her to Gan Eden, and they're going to say, what do you want? What, what do you love to do the most in your life? She says, shopping. I say, here's the credit card, you can go shopping. He says, I'm going to get up there, they're going to see what I did. Boy, am I going to get it. They're going to go Gehenim. They go, what is the worst thing in your life that you have to go through? He goes shopping, so I'm going to be together with my wife, he says at the end. Okay. You know that woman that said she wants to be buried in Walmart? They said, why? They said, at least you know her daughters will come visit her once a week. You know? Okay. But the point is that there is a way to get into Gan Eden. There are shortcuts, easy paths. But we feel very foolish if we're there, we don't know what to do there. When a person is in a situation, this is how Rabbi Tzaddik explains it, where you're overwhelmed with anger, and you say, I'm going to suppress this anger, I'm going to wait it out. If I answer back now, I'm going to say the wrong things. When you're in the same is true if you're overwhelmed with a passion, for something. And the same is true if you're overwhelmed with a depression. Your entire body is now under the scope. If you fight your way out of it, and fighting your way out of it doesn't mean instant success. It means chazak, 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 until the nis chazek. So you have now corrected every fiber of your being. When you're going into Gan Eden, you're going into Gan Eden fully. You totally deserve it. Furthermore, explains Reb Tzaddik that anger is a tangible reality. There's a flame that is burning within you. Taiva, passion, is a tangible reality. The Gemara tells us the story of Rav Amram Chasida, who saved a bunch of girls, ransomed them, and he put them up in his attic overnight. They should be safe. And as he passed by, he saw the image of one of them in the moonlight, and his, he was overwhelmed with a passion to go and to uh, suggest to one of them to be with him. And Umar says he took a ladder that normally that's how it was burning his desire. Normally it would take ten people to carry this ladder. And as he started going up the ladder, he said, I can lose everything now. And he began to yell, fire, 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 Nura Amram, and everyone came running. And they're standing there, and he's standing there in his pajamas on the ladder, and the girls are looking out. And you can imagine that, uh, what do they call the picture takers, the paza... Paserati, what are they called? The ones that come to take pictures, right? You can imagine what the press was going to do with this picture. So as Talmidim said, Rabbi, you embarrassed us. He says, Mutav better that I be a, that I be a shaita kal yamav, and I shouldn't be a rasha achas lefnei And as he stood there on the ladder, he said, God, I did whatever I can do. Now please take this Yetzirah away. And the Gemara says, they envisioned a tremendous flame that came out of him. In other words, God made the Yetzirah tangible for the Talmidim to see how a person can take and do it out. Now says Reb Tzadik, and Reb Nachman of Breslev writes this as well, that caste is a reality, depression is a reality, passion is a reality, these are malachim, your entire body is inflamed. There's a tangible reality there. When you suppress that reality, that reality doesn't disappear, it is converted. It is converted to blessing, it is converted to bracha, it is converted to parnasa, it is converted to yeshuas. It keeps us going. Now I know this is a lot easier said than done, but by the same token, it could be done. It could be done if we look at life from a different perspective. The, uh, somebody once came to the Baal Shem Tov. He said, Rebbe, I want to become one of your Talmidim. He said, you're not ready yet. He says, Rebbe, I want to become one of you. He says, you're not ready yet. And finally he says, I just, you, you ready? Then I want to tell you what you're destined to go through in life. Your wife is going to turn on you because of events that are going to take place. Your neighbors are going to believe the stories. They're going to turn on you. The entire town is going to turn on you. You're going to be all alone. Even the birds are going to turn on you. Are you willing to accept that this is your lot? He said, you know, thanks for the blessing, but uh, okay. 
So he comes home, he leaves the Baal Shem Tev. he doesn't understand what the Baal Shem Tev wanted from him, and at one point his wife accused him of something which he did not do, the circumstantial evidence was wrong, she was infuriated with him, threw him out of the house, the other neighbors wouldn't look at him, his kids were thrown out of school, and he was so hurt, he was so angry, he was so determined to take revenge, and at one point he's all alone, he's standing on a road, and this wild turkey jumps onto his head as he's praying, he says, that's it! And he grabs the turkey and he's about to smash it down on the floor, smash it to smithereens, smash it to pieces. Suddenly he remembers what the Baal Shem Tov says. And he goes, you poor turkey. This was my lot, that this had to happen to me. What am I angry at you for? Baal Shem Tov said, even the birds, he said that. So he like petted the turkey and let it go away. Then he began to think, so why am I angry at my town? This was my lot. Why am I angry at my neighbors? This was my lot. Why am I angry at my wife? This is my lot. And slowly but surely he began to accept whatever happens, happens. And whatever his wife thought that he did, she, she later found out that she didn't, and all of a sudden the next day she came crying and asked Mechila, and everything began to change. Anger is based on the idea that we're angry at someone. We're angry at someone, we feel we were hurt or we were slighted. In our Amunah, this is a lot easier said than done. But in our belief and in our amuna, that guess what? We can't be slighted. We can't be hurt unless it's our lot. So it's nothing to do with you. You're just Hashem's shliach. You're just Hashem's messenger. My father said, he learned in the Vardik, he said he saw this with his own eyes, that they were running away and the Russians caught them. In the, in the Bolshevik, I don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly what it was. And one of them said, they were all holding the Mars, which wasn't too... Uh, and one of them put a gun at, uh, there was Ramatcha Pragamansky, it was, an, it was an Ish Kaddish. And he said, I'm going to kill you. And he looked the Russian into the face, the Russian general, he said, listen, if God decreed last Rosh Hashanah that you're going to kill me, it's God killing me, you're just a shliach. And you'll get paid for murdering me, that's all, that's nothing to do with you. He said, I am going to kill you. He said, nothing to do with you. God wants me to die. I'm going to die. He was so infuriated that he wasn't shivering in front of him. He said, I'm not going to kill you. He said, don't kill me. He's like, he was like a catch-22. He just, just fired into the air. He says, oh, you just get out of here. The Baal Shem Tev says that in the course of our lives, if we can take a deep breath and say, before you're about to throw the plate back or the pie back, wait a second. This was my lot. Maybe my mistake. It doesn't mean the person is right for throwing the pie or the insult or the hurt. But I had to go through this. This is my tikkun hanefesh. It has nothing to do with the person. You can work your way back from the bird back to where it is. And I want to conclude with the following story. You may have heard this from me before, but it means a lot to me, and I want to say it. I would, I'm going to take the liberty of saying it again. I don't know how many of you here have ever been to Dubai. If you've never been there, no, to help. But there's this super tower there. Super tower, super technological tower. I hear you drive your car in, and it takes you up all the way until your apartment, lest you have to walk a few steps. So this guy is showing me this brochure, as if I'm going to buy an apartment there. And he says, for an additional $3 million, mind you, an additional $3 million. This is not the apartment. He goes, you press a button, and the entire apartment spins around. I said, what? You heard me. So just imagine that I can press a button here, you just press this button over here, and uh, all of a sudden this bookcase is over there, and that door and the exit sign is over here. Now how's that? I said, I can't understand why anyone in his right mind would spend $3 million on a merry-go-round ride. And go to Coney Island, it's a lot cheaper trying to think what a, you know, what a nice Jewish household can do with a toy like this. Uh, imagine a collector comes to the front door, and one minute, boom, right? What am I doing? How did I get to the back door here? I don't know. I, I couldn't, I, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Why would someone spend $3 million on this? And then I had the answer. I went to be Menachem Oval. I went to do a condolence call, and a friend of mine who lives in the projects in Williamsburg, the housing projects are, whoop, he's up high on the 13th floor. And this narrow elevator, so scary, so this. And I walk in there, and it's like, ooh, why do you live in these things? Look, the elevator seems spooky. You know, he had told me he came from an old town, little town. He came to America the first time. He was in Manhattan. He had never seen an elevator before. The door opened up. He sees this little kid skip in. The door closes. Opens up a minute later. An old man walks out in a cane. He goes, let's get away from this machine. You know, I don't want anything to do with this. Okay. 
So I walk in and we sit down next to my friend and I say to him, I, I, I say to him, you grew up here? Him and six brothers and three sisters? In this small apartment? Whoa, Nebuch. He says, what's the Nebuch? He says, we were much happier than most people, where most kids were. He says, uh, in this apartment? Yeah, in this apartment, no backyard, no front yard. We, we, had, we, had a, we, we enjoyed life, we enjoyed each other. He says, not only that, we had a minion here every Friday night. Okay, every Friday night, they can, because it's very hard for some people to walk down and walk up the stairs. Some people don't want to use the Shabbos elevator. So Shabbos morning, people go to their shuls. Friday night, every couple of floors has a minion. So I said, that must have been nice, have a minion here Friday night. He says, yeah, it was really nice. He says, let me tell you how nice it was. Okay? Try to imagine an early, the earliest Shabbos of the year, midwinter. Candle lighting is at 4 o'clock. Okay? And the, ha the house is screaming, and the diapers, and the baby, and the one, and the one, that shoulder's pouring over, and everyone's running back and forth. Someone knocks on the door a half hour before candle lighting. My father's holding one screaming baby in one hand, another one, another screaming baby on top of his head. He's holding a mop and a pail in the other hand. He opens up the door. This guy's all dressed for Shabbos. He says, yeah, is this, this the shul where we're davening Friday night? He goes, yeah, but it's like a half hour to candle lighting. He says, my custom is, I come to shul a half hour beforehand Friday night, and I say, shira shirim, and I'm Avrasedra. And he marches himself and sits himself down on the couch. And then you can imagine the normal sounds in a house right before Shabbos, a half hour screaming, yelling, and he keeps going, no, no. So, he says, my father says to him, maybe you go up and say, shira shirim, upstairs in, in your apartment. He says, he can, it's too noisy over there, he says. A couple of minutes later, somebody else knocks on the door. He says, what are, yeah, he says, uh, he's here to use the shul's bathroom. He walks and he's there for 20 minutes. Everything, the washing machine is in the bathroom, everything, the kids are polishing. He said, it was a nightmare. And people would show up five minutes before the end of Davani. They would say, we, we can't leave yet. We, what, what are we supposed to tell our wives? You know, go right back, five minutes later, we just left. He says, for 44 years, there was this minion Friday night. He, they were up to the soup, and people were still schmoozing around, lingering around in the uh, thing. You know? They finished the dessert. This guy would come knocking on the door. When did we start davening? Oh, we davening. Like, it was oh, every Friday night. Every Friday night, something broke as the kids in the building went running through. Took a tour of the shul's bedrooms and the shul's closets and everything else. Now, normally, the custom was in these buildings that every four weeks, it rotated to a different apartment. But after the four weeks, my father and mother come, and they say that they decided that they're keeping the minion here. We said, what? We decided we're keeping the minion here. Why? My father never went on vacation, never went to the country in the summer. When he passed away, he asked that whoever takes over the apartment should continue the minion. We never knew why. He says, we're sitting here, we're in mourning. The upstairs neighbor comes up. He says, I want to, do you know why your father kept the minion here? They said, no, we don't know why. He says, I'll tell you, okay? 44 years ago. The minion was slated to come to me next. Me and my wife were having our marital issues. She was angry, and sometimes I was angry, and we would throw things at each other. It wasn't a pretty sight. And Friday, a few minutes before Shabbos, it wasn't just the oven that got heated up. It was like the pressure made us both crack. And one day, my wife said, they're coming here to this apartment. One guy walks in here five minutes before candle lighting. I grab his trimal, that's the fur hat that Hasidim wear, and we, out the window from the 13th floor, let him go fish it out from the East River. Now you know it says, Tzadikim Omrim Ma'at Ve'osim Harba. They speak little and do a lot. He said, my wife is a real Tzadikus, if you know what I mean. I said, this is going to be a disaster. And not only that, I was concerned. I said, it's going to be the end of my marriage. I know it. And I burst into tears. Your father looked at me, and your father said, I have an idea. I'm going to say that it's so important to have the minion over here, I'm keeping the minion in my house. And he kept the minion in his house for 44 years to save this person's marriage. So he shouldn't be embarrassed. And then I understood. There are those that are willing to spend $3 million, let the world turn around me. And there are those that are willing to say, listen, I'm here for a reason, okay? It's not this apartment. 
because no one's here forever. We're all tenants. I remember when I was in Yerushalayim, there was a big fight. Somebody extended his thing, and our landowner came down. He used to bring us kugel every Friday. He said, you're not part of the fight. The guy extended the porch. He goes, I'm just a tenant here. What's well, not worth fighting about? So you're not a tenant. We're paying you rent. You own your apartment. He goes, everyone of this world is just a tenant. Do you understand? Not worth fighting about. I think it's one of the reasons we turn around by Boyu B'Shalom, Friday night. We're saying to Hashem, listen, wherever you send me, that's where I'm supposed to be. Okay? You can live your life one of two ways. You can demand everyone turns around you, and you'd spend $3 million for it. But you're not going to be happy. And you definitely aren't investing in any good real estate up there. Or you can live your life in such a way, whatever happens, happens. I am willing to spin and to turn whatever it takes, Hashem. Put my rubbers on, I'll put my rubbers off, whatever it takes. Because I believe I have to go through. This is my test, my Nisayim. If you do that, I don't know what your apartment looks like down here. But I can tell you the real estate up there in Shemayim that lasts forever where you're a permanent resident will be something that people from all over are going to want to come, are going to want to come and see. Thank you very much.